will slowly uh, start this afternoon uh, session. So I'm Tanya Samadic, I will be chairing the session. And um, to start with, I would just like to link it to one of the numerous discussions that we had in previous sessions. And the discussion was about how one can join the, the world of technology, especially natural language processing and machine learning. And there were some uh, ideas in the chat, but um, maybe we could say that probably one of the best ways to join this uh, area is to follow one of the two masters. Uh, that are organized um, in uh, different European universities. And today we have representatives of two master programs today. Um, and so, so we have a half an hour session to talk about how it is to, to study language and technology at the master level. Although our project is um, uh, aiming more at the undergraduate level, because for many people who study what we saw was called pure linguistics or real linguistics or fields like that, it might be already quite a big step to go from such a program to a master in technology that, uh, that are available, right? So this is why we organize this session, so to see how we can link now these two levels of education and what can we do at the undergraduate level in order to make it easier or smoother to take such a master and then uh, develop a career in this domain. So uh, since uh, Ivana, our first speaker, uh, is already ready, so Ivana will uh, present <laughs> the program, the European uh, Master for Language Technology and Science. Um, I will just uh, let you, you know, briefly present yourself and uh, introduce your talk, and then we will continue with other speakers in the session. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the, well, first of all, for the invitation to share our experience and uh, yeah, for the introduction. So yeah, my name is uh, Ivana Kruijf and I lead the European Master's Programme in Language and Communication Technologies, which uh, as you just said, is one of the programs at the European level, master's programs where one can yeah, study in order to become a uh, natural language processing uh, specialist. And uh, you really provided a very good introduction um, and it's uh, kind of it's uh, I, I think it's very interesting uh, where you said you kind of like your project is kind of busy at the undergraduate level um, and uh, students yeah can do a master's program in order to to enter the the, the more technological uh, world and actually one of the points that I'll be making is in some sense a homework or a yeah let's call it a homework for the linguistics undergraduate programs, uh, which, yeah, okay, it will become apparent on, on my next slide. I uh, have uh, prepared, so, so yeah, okay, I'm not sure how much I should be, I only have five minutes, I'm not sure how much I should be saying about the program as such. There is a website, if people are interested, then please go have a look, and of course, do not uh, hesitate to uh, contact uh, me or uh, any other program representative um, if you have uh, questions about the program. Program. So we are an Erasmus Mundus program consisting of seven partners uh, all over Europe, um, which uh, you can see the logos there. I did not really include a program introduction into these slides. I just focused on the experience uh, that we have in terms of taking in linguistics uh, students. So yeah, we are, and I, I am learning from, from people that we are one of the few programs that do master's programs that do a language, um, that do natural language processing, which accepts, accepts students with uh, kind of more or less pure linguistics uh, background. Um, at least I hear it from some students that they didn't find any such any other such program. I'm not sure this is 100% true, but anyway, we do accept students from both uh, computer science or linguistics background. And here the focus is on linguistics. Now, what do I mean by linguistics? Now, some I've just included some specific examples of students that we had and what uh, what student, what programs they are coming from. So uh, clear candidates are programs that are like theoretical linguistics, but also we had students from philology and linguistics or programs that are labeled something like language linguistics and literary study. I should say that in our acceptance, 
yeah, requirements, we set as a requirement that the students should have at least some formal linguistics background. It's really hard to define this. In the, uh, in the except in the selection procedure, we, we look at this, we look at the actual transcripts of record, and we look at what they, what students have done in terms of formal language description. But, and I'll be showing this on the next slide, this is not enough uh, to study the really more technical side of uh, natural language processing. And um, in order to not speak only like from, from my or our perspective as the you know, well, teachers or providers of the course, but to take a more student-oriented perspective, I actually polled our alumni and current students uh, to give me feedback, to give me input uh, for the session, for this session, for what you asked me uh, to speak about. And uh, here is what came uh, back. And this is kind of like uh, distilled from feedback from a number of students. And also looking back at uh, questionnaires or su surveys that we do among our students, asking them where did they struggle academically? So uh, looking at the academic uh, subjects where linguistic students are struggling, are missing background, is this basic, meaning fundamental concepts in several fields, actually. Mass, data structures and algorithms, and kind of basic programming, especially in Python, and uh, some machine learning basic concepts. So. And, 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 and what I really mean is like the very, very basics, because the, the, the problem that we are facing as a program, as a master level program, is that we actually do not cover these very, very basics. We kind of, we assume that the students have a certain basic level, and then we build on top of that. Sometimes... I mean, we have asked ourselves, or we have even tried to provide kind of a bridging course where, you know, at the beginning, people could fill in the background. It's just that this is not something that you can easily do within one week. And it's also different people miss different bits. I mean, some miss all of this, and then they really struggle. <laughs> but usually they have something. And the com there are so many combinations that it's difficult. And, and, you know, doing all of this in one week is just not possible. And, you know, it's not in our power to do like a, you know, two months fill in course, right? So on these subjects, the only solution that I can see is that either the students use possibilities such as Udemy or Coursera and do some very basic courses there as a preparation between their uh, undergraduate program and entering the master's or that linguistics undergraduate programs actually do include some of these topics at a fundamental level, which classically are not typical for, uh, for such a program. It's a, it's a fact of life that today, if you, anything that you wanna do that has to do with language processing, even if you just do kind of like, you know, data oriented, I mean, as in, as in language resources oriented stuff or, yeah, or applied translation, you always come across some computation. So basic programming and kind of feeling for that is really essential. Machine learning, not all of such people might end up doing, but still you come in some touch. So these are really fundamental things that would be ideal for the students and for the master's programs that would be present. This is not all, I'll try to keep it short. I have one more slide and that, they, that, is, that, is, that is something that the students came up with, which I never realized, but when I read it, I completely understood what they, are, what they mean. And that is a certain attitude. It may be that some, I'm not saying that no linguistic student has this attitude, but I can very well understand that many of them indeed have struggled with this. And I have put in straight quotes from several different students the way they formulated this problem. They are saying that they miss or missed confidence to explore and make mistakes without worrying about breaking things. This is a very practical attitude. This is like, you know, go and do it and fail and learn from the failure and then you know, do the next thing. This is how programming works. Another quote, hands-on approach to tasks 
and to not be discouraged, but by being thrown into a practical task and asked to swim. So very often when you're developing some technical artifact, you have to solve it as you go. There is no textbook that you read before and find a solution and then you do it, right? You have to discover as you're doing it. Another quote, Googling around and watching YouTube tutorials as a way to learn skills. The student was saying, you know, I was used to this kind of textbook approach. First, learn the proper way and then go and apply it. And I just wasn't sure, like, what, you know, am I even allowed? Is it the proper way to teach myself by whatever source I can find? And finally, as a basic attitude, it's okay to feel sort of, sort of clueless at first. It's okay to ask very basic questions. It's okay to not have any literature to guide one through a hands-on topic. So this is something that, yeah, as I said, I found, uh, I found very interesting that the students came up with this. I very well understand it. And it's a matter of basic attitude that wants to be exercised. So to close, on the one hand, fundamentals in certain academic subjects. On the other hand, a certain kind of attitude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivana. You were really, you know, if I gave a nice introduction to you, you were really saying everything that I ever wanted to say to people. <laughs> so that's a lot. <laughs> it's really just, you know, music to my ears. Um, but uh, so now, uh, since we also have uh, like representatives of students from this program, and so it was nice that you finished with some quotes uh, from uh, yeah. students, I would like to invite uh, Gaetano Ruggero. I see that. Uh, she is here and I thought that she was also um, uh, active in the chat to perhaps comment on this. Do you agree with uh, what Ivana uh, summarized or do you have something to add? Uh, hi. Hi, Gaetano. <laughs> hi, Ivana. <laughs> well, I definitely agree. Yes. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I guess I was invited today because I'm one of those students, you know, who went from a um, purely linguistic background to uh, joining the LCP master program. Um, and I definitely, definitely think it's about attitude mostly because, you know, you struggle psychologically uh, with dealing with so many new information at the same time, right? Um, so I did my bachelor's in Naples uh, uh, at the University of Naples L'Orientale and it was in cultural and linguistic mediation. And then I uh, joined the LCP program and I spent the first year studying at the University of Malta and the second year at the University of Groningen. And I mean, what can I say about this? Um, in, in my bachelor's, I definitely had a good education about, you know, ling purely linguistics um, matters and also about the use of language, about the culture related to it, about the literature. But um, definitely what was missing was even knowing that there was a computational way of doing things. So, I, I mean, I, I, I graduated in, in 2016, so it was a few years ago, so now might have changed, but uh, I did not even know that there was a computational world, you know, that was used wow. to uh, translate a text with the good old dictionary. So I didn't know there was a whole, um, you know, field of study on machine translation, for example. Um, so I, I definitely was missing this part. And, you know, when, you, when I joined the LCT program, it was a challenge because mm. I did not know anything about programming. So all of a sudden you're just thrown into this, uh, you know, class with people who probably uh, know more uh, and you have to catch up and be, it, it needs to be fast because you're suddenly learning about NLP, about machine learning, but at the same time, you're also learning about programming in general. So I definitely wished there would have been some kind of, uh, you know, foundations in my, in, in my bachelor's uh, with programming and even with, um, you know, it was using Linux, for example. So the first day of classes in my LCT program, you know, someone told me, um, oh, you're using a laptop with Windows. Well, let's switch to Linux. I did not know what Linux was and even less how to install it on my on my laptop, you know, so this is like very basic things that I guess they could be some kind somehow integrated in the, in a better program. Um, and what else? I definitely think I also had to learn how to do research. Um, 
because I did not know what doing research even meant. I did not know how to write a paper, uh, how to decide uh, on a project, how to collect the data. I did not know any of this. And one other thing that I think it's really important to develop in an un at an undergraduate uh, level is the teamwork. Um, so during exactly the what we heard also from uh, the, the grads uh, yeah. presentation. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because you you know mm -hmm. you're during my master I was uh, really uh, you know put to work with other people, and so you kind of need to learn. There's a whole dynamic to it, right? And you kind of need to know, uh, you know, who does what, and you also need to be aware that not everybody has the same skills. So you kind of need to, you know, uh, balance the whole group in a way. So that that was also really important. Great. Um, Look, uh, sorry, Gaeta, I see that you have many, many examples, but we are now uh, running a little bit out of time and I see Sarah ready to, to step in. We only have a half an hour, but uh, please stay in and uh, probably you will have a chance to share your experiences later on when there is a general discussion and also breakout room. So uh, I'd be very, very grateful if you can continue with your list. And for now, I will thank uh, you both, Ivana, especially because I hear from some insiders that you even have another meeting going at the same time but it's also important that you are still here present with us so thanks a lot for taking the time to to share with us um, your view of, of the situation a very general overview and so now i think we move to uh, the other european program which is in translation and technology and here we have sara moshe right yeah that's correct who will who will uh, say something about this program and potential connection with the undergraduate studies Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, can you see my slides now? Can you see yes. my Okay. Um, and I'm just going to do it like this. Okay, excellent. First of all, thank you to the organizers for inviting us to participate in this very interesting event. So my name is Sarah, and I'm here to represent the European Masters in Technology for Translation and Interpreting, also known as EMDTI. I'm here in my capacity as local coordinator at the University of Wolverhampton, one of the universities of the consortium. And today I'm joined uh, by two student representatives, Helena and Marina, who will be um, sharing their experience on the course with us later on. All right, um, I'll try to be brief, but I've prepared way too many slides, so please bear with me. Uh, so I'd just like to start by giving a brief outline of what EMTTI is all about. So this is actually the first ever master's program in technology for translation and interpreting. It is an Erasmus Mundus uh, program, just like the other program we just um, heard about. Uh, and one of the distinctive features of this course is its strong industrial and research focus. So what do I mean by that? Um, so employability is actually embedded at the core of this master's program. For instance, all of our students are required to complete two one month mandatory placements, at least one of which must be at an industrial partner. Uh, we also have representatives uh, from the industry sitting on our various boards, so selection boards, examination boards, uh, management boards as well, which um, so they are able to advise us as to the curriculum and any other aspects related to the course. And when I talk about research uh, focus, obviously uh, the program is um, underpinned by the latest developments in the field. But uh, more importantly, half of the credits that our students obtain from this program are actually from the dissertation. So the work of the dissertation, which is really important for us. So the consortium is, um, which runs the course uh, is composed of four universities, four partners, the University of Wolverhampton in the UK. So we are the coordinating institution. Then we have the University of Malaga in Spain, the new Bulgarian University and Ghent University. But more importantly, we also have a wide network of associated partners, most of whom are leading companies in the translation and interpreting business, and also several non-EC universities, such as, for instance, the University of Johannesburg. And this is really important because this is where our students go on placements. So um, it is important to have a strong network of good and reliable partners in the field. So um, as to the career pathways, so our applicants normally come from two main backgrounds, either from a linguistics slash translation background or from a computational background, computer science. So for this reason, our course um, aims to educate a new generation of translators and interpreters who are up to date 
with the latest tools and resources in the field, um, because this has been identified as a key area by industrial partners, but also those who have a more computational background uh, can then become developers of future translation and interpreting technologies. And of course, because of its research focus, this master's program is also a good springboard for any students wishing to pursue a PhD. So very, very quickly about the curriculum so that you know what kind of um, skills and knowledge we try to impart on our students. So this is a two-year master's program. Students basically uh, spent one year at one of the universities in the consortium, and then the second year at another university in the consortium. They have two supervisors from the two institutions. Half of the credits are basically linked to the work on dissertation, and then the rest is thought modules. So each and every partner has a wide selection of thought modules, uh, focusing on either specialized topics in translation, for instance, machine translation, localization, audiovisual translation, consecutive interpreting, we have uh, modules in Python programming, project management for translators and so forth. But we also cover topics that are slightly more general, such as, for instance, research methods, which is really important, but also general linguistics topics, such as corpus linguistics, lexicology, lexicography, terminology, technical writing, NLP, and so forth. So um, I think this is really, really important because this allows our students to really pick and choose. So they can come up with the best combination of modules for their professional background, um, also for the needs for the research interests. So they can really tailor the learning experience to the needs and requirements. All right, um, one of the things that I was asked to kind of prepare is um, to briefly comment on the ideal applicant or the type of applicants that typically come to our courses. And uh, here I'd like to kind of make a general distinction between basic requirements and additional desirables, which we have in mind when we consider these applicants. So all of our applicants, regardless of whether they're applying for a scholarship or whether they're self-funded students, must have obtained a bachelor's degree in one of the areas related to the course. But of course, candidates with a background in translation, interpreting computer science, computational linguistics and modern languages are given priority. They also must have some kind of language skills, obviously. So um, the language of instruction is English. So we require at least C1 level proven by certificates and also knowledge of at least one additional language taught by the partners in the interpreting and translation modules. So here we require minimum B2 level. Again, we require certificates unless you are a native speaker of those languages, then you don't have to submit anything. All right, um, as far as the additional desirables that I was talking about, uh, these are considered especially with scholarship applications because the, the whole process is quite competitive. We get hundreds of applications every year, as you can imagine. So ideally, the ideal candidate should have at least some experience in working as a professional translation, translator, <clears throat> sorry, interpreter, programmer, or developer in the field. And we usually have a look at the CV to establish this. Um, then, of course, research experience. Now, yes, we do like candidates who do well academically, who have obtained good grades, but this goes beyond that. So um, candidates who have maybe participated in research projects, either on a national, international level, have an edge over others, and even some applicants who have previous publications in the field, such as conference workshop papers, um, journal papers and so forth. So obviously most candidates don't have them. They don't have any previous research experience, which is fine. It's not the requirement, but those that, that do have this have an edge over everyone else. Then the next one that's really important for us is IT skills. And of course here, I'm not talking about knowing how to use a word processor, but rather two types of skills. So skills in the use of CAD tools, so computer assisted technology, um, and uh, also programming skills. So here we're talking about basic or advanced programming skills. Um, obviously we want candidates to submit certificates showing that they've undertaken training, or maybe um, if a candidate has uh, studied programming at undergraduate level, that counts. Or if they worked as professional developers or programmers, that also counts as advanced programming skills. So we do take that into consideration. And last but definitely not least, we really want highly motivated and goal-oriented uh, candidates who have a genuine interest in translation technology. And this is why we really do read your motivation letters very, very carefully. So um, a not so good candidate would say something along the lines of, 
Well, I've always been interested in languages and passionate about languages. This is why I'm applying. But what we really want is somebody to say, I'm specifically applying to this program because, and tell us about it. So we want to know um, that you are interested in the technological aspect specifically. We want to see that you've researched the program, you are familiar with the modules, the areas covered by the program, and good candidates usually can link it back to their professional experience and tell us how this will benefit them. Sometimes they also already know uh, what kind of topics they wish to explore in the dissertations. So we really want to see that you are genuine, genuinely interested in the course. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much, Sarah, for these very, very concrete tips. And I think that will uh, also resonate in uh, our uh, participants' heads, you know, for uh, some time. Like, um, and I think it's a really, a totally different view of how to approach the, the next step in your studies. Mm -hmm. And that's really, yeah, very insightful. So should we use this uh, remaining of this time, not so much to hear uh, the student that you mentioned? We have Marina, right? Uh, yeah. Um, uh -huh. So okay. actually, I do have a slides for them if, if they okay, want. Okay, that's great. We can go very quickly. Marina yes. and Halina. I saw her. I saw her. Uh, Hi. 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 Can you hear me well? <laughs> yes. Thank you. So I saw that you were responding in the chat. So maybe I was uh, just. Yes, I was it. trying to answer some questions, and I would Thanks like to agree uh, with everything that has been said and um, I can add that it is also very important apart from the basic training in IT. I think it is also important to uh, teach students some soft skills and the skills that the students will need when they enter the market because not all of them are going to be employed by big companies or work as in-house translators or programmers or interpreters since most of them i guess will be working as freelancers i think it's also very important to give them some uh, basic understanding of the soft skills that mm -hmm. they will need in the market how to negotiate with the customers how to uh, be an entrepreneur because for example if you're a freelancer you have to think about taxes, rates, uh, invoicing, payments, uh, regulations. And I think it's also very important because when I started working as a freelancer some six years ago, I had to learn the ropes myself. I was lucky to have senior colleagues who could help me. But in most cases, it is not like that. And I think that it should be an essential part of any master's teaching yeah. students how to uh, run their own businesses or so maybe given how... that for this particular master you already have to have some kind of experience that would be already good to yes yes as but as possible right yes so it, it it's very relevant to how to operate as a project manager for example because it is sometimes um, you know our customers they need jack of all trades not just the person who can translate or program, but the person who can organize all the processes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the pandemic started, I had to give several workshops to my clients on how to operate uh, remote interpretation because none of them knew what the systems are and what is uh, available on the market and they were at a loss. So this is just what we Great. need. Great, thanks a lot. That also looks quite clear to me. So, we, uh, so the other student was Helena, right? Um, do we have some time to hear her too, or or we can just see? Helena, Helena would you like to add? Helena, um, yes. Hello. Hello, Helena. <laughs> nice to meet I you. I wanted uh, to add that. Uh, well, I'm a second year student, so I'm graduating uh, this summer. And uh, I spent the first year in Bulgaria uh, studying such subjects as like translation and CAD tools, uh, linguistics as well. And in second year, I'm doing in Wolverhampton, where it's more NLP oriented. And I also come from a linguistic background, like pure linguistics. Uh, but uh, I've written my dissertation here on deep learning. So uh, I just wanted to tell other like, students, potential students, that it's, it is possible. It is challenging, but it is possible. Uh, and for linguists, there are also areas in LP that um, where they can contribute. Uh, for example, machine translation evaluation, terminology extraction, 
improving the quality of um, um, translation memories, uh, NLP for educational purposes. These are all the fields where ethnic linguists would be uh, quite, um, that the, the industry will benefit um, from uh, linguistic knowledge as well. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. So I guess, you know, there is uh, the, the message here is, yeah, there is some effort to put in, but uh, in the end it pays off. Yes. <laughs> it opens up opportunities, right? Thank you everybody for this session. Uh, so uh, it, I, I hope uh, it was uh, something like um, very like personal also for other people so that they could identify with.